Okay, we're on page 102. We're going to take the, the first blessing inside of the requests that we make over here, which is a blessing that uh, has somewhat significance. Ata choyne le'odam das. We, we, uh, we ask a Kodesh Baruch Hu to give us wisdom. Uh, that he should give us insight and discern, wisdom, insight and discernment. So before we go any further, let's just try to work out something rather interesting over here about wisdom. There's different... Doesn't wisdom come with age? Huh? Doesn't wisdom come with age? Not that I've noticed. Um, <laughs> the, uh, there are certain... Here, everybody here has heard of Chabad. Oh, yeah. Right? Chabad, of course, is an acronym... For Chochma, Bina, Bina and Dat. Very good, yeah. right? So let's try to work out what Chochma, Bina and Dat are. Chochma is the simplest dimension of, of information. So if somebody right. tells you something you don't know, so now they've just given you Chochma. So for example, somebody teaches you that 2 plus 2 is 4. <coughs> so now that's a, that's, you've just been given knowledge. Let's call Chochma knowledge, right? Now you know something that you didn't know before. From knowing that 2 plus 2 equals 4, you can then work out that 3 plus 2 equals 5. Maybe not by you, but, sure? but you can check it out on your phone, but I'm not sure it will give you the right answer. Um, but, so what, Bina, Bina comes from the word of, of uh, Boine, to build, which means that Rashi explains that Bina means Lavin dava mitoch dava. You learn something from within something else, which means you've got knowledge now. And with that knowledge, you're able to build further and to become even more knowledgeable than you were. Right? That is, I, I think maybe we should describe that as being intuition. Rashi, Rashi describes that as being Ruach HaKodesh, which is divine inspiration, which we're in pretty short supply of nowadays. But in general, the idea of that is something where people have an insight are able to understand things and see things in a way that other people cannot. And that comes, in, in Jewish concepts, that comes from a very deep dimension of something having a purity of neshama, his, his soul is very pure, he's able to see things that other people cannot see. That's why, for example, many people go to get da'at Torah, which means that you want to do something, something very important in your life, you're not sure you should do it or you shouldn't do it, so you go to get... Uh, you've got to get um, advice from somebody who may not know you very well, may not know you at all, but they have an insight through their Torah knowledge which may be able to give you uh, information that you wouldn't have known otherwise. Right? So it's interesting. Over here, we don't use Chochmah Bina Dar, although in Nusach they do. Over here, we use the words Deya Bina Vahatskel, but it's talking about the same kind of a concept. We're asking God to give us three different dimensions of generic knowledge, which means knowledge of information we're given, the ability to build on that information and to become more knowledgeable and to then to reach a level, a much higher level of, of uh, that, which is something which very few people are able to get to. And in order to have that, you have to have Chochmah and Bina. But if you have Chochmah and Bina, you don't necessarily have that. It's, a, it's, a, uh, you know, it's, it's something which requires a tremendous amount of of effort and purity in order to be able to get there. It's interesting that the first thing that we're asking for over here in the Amida is Bina, right? Knowledge, right? That we should have insight to be able to serve God properly. You've got to understand why you're serving God. So that's the first thing that we're going to ask for. It's also interesting that in the Amida on Motsoi Shabbos and on Motsoi Yom Tov, like on, on uh, yesterday night when you dive in the Amida, Notice I said when, not, not if. When you davened the Amida last night, so you said, which is the extra prayer that's added in when it comes to the end of something holy, right? So when we get to the end of Shabbat, we get to the end of Yom Tov, we add in an extra prayer, which is allowing us the ability to differentiate between good and evil, and, and uh, you know, a night and day, and, and clarity and non-clarity. Where does that prayer come in? In the prayer of Lord and Das, that you give wisdom to human beings. I'll tell you something fascinating about the concept of wisdom in general. There was a story, I don't know if it's an apocryphal story, I read it, well, I, I read it as a true story, but nevertheless there was a, 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 a substitute teacher 
young, young lady who just graduated not very long ago in the inner, inner city New York school who was given the most impossible class that there was. Right? They, they'd been through a lot of teachers and uh, n nobody wanted this class at all. So they, they gave it to her. She was obviously, you know, she, she couldn't say no. So she was given it. And all of a sudden, she started teaching this class and things started changing inside of the class. The students started listening. And by the end of the year, the students had done pretty well in their exams. So the, uh, the uh, principal, at the end of the year, calls over this rookie teacher. You know, she's, she has no, no, uh, no experience whatsoever. Calls over this rookie teacher and says, how on earth did you manage to do what you did? Right? Nobody else was successful with this class. So she said the most astonishing thing. She looked at the teacher and said, why? She said, they're very, very, bright, very, very bright bunch. So he says to her, how did you know that they were bright? They never, they never experienced, they, they, never, they never exposed any, you know, any signs of being bright before. How do you know that? So she said, I don't know. She says, when you gave me the class list at the beginning of the year, you gave me their IQs next to them. And each one had an IQ that was in the upper 90s or in the 100s. She says, I just taught my classes according to their IQ level. So the principal has got no idea what she's talking about. Oh, right? It huh? It wasn't IQ, but... It wasn't IQ. It was their locker number. Yeah. Um... Right? <laughs> That's all it was. Nothing else. What was fascinating about the thing was that it's interesting, right, that because everybody up till then had been teaching them as if they were idiots... So, of course, they're going to react as if they're idiots. She came in and quite, quite genuinely imagined that they were very bright, and she started teaching them as if they were very bright, and they responded in like. Which It's interesting that the Bina has got nothing to do with your IQ. It really doesn't. bina has got nothing to do with whether, whether you're brilliant. If God, God makes you brilliant, right? God gives you a high IQ. God gives you the ability to understand things easily. That's just a, it's just a bracha. That's all it is, right? It's a, it's a blessing that allows you to be able to absorb information easily. And if not, it doesn't mean that you can't do it. It just means you've got to try a little bit harder. But what we see in learning Torah is that the more that a person struggles and strives to learn Torah and sincerely wants to know Torah, so in the end, the greater is their success. But isn't that with anything in life? I think not, not, I think it depends what, right? If you're talking about, for example, in intellectual endeavors, the answer is probably yes. If you're talking about physically, then no, probably not. Because, you know, somebody who is, let's say somebody who's, you know, five foot two, right, is, is probably never going to get onto the NBA, right? I mean, you, you know, there are, physical, there are physical things that are stopping somebody from reaching levels that they would like to reach. Right, I think, if, if I'm not mistaken, to get into the Marines, you have to be six foot tall. Right? What? No, no, no. The, no. No? No. Maybe it's like a special division. Maybe, maybe something inside of something. Probably I don't know what it yeah, is. It's a special where, like, well, I mean, they don't want you because you're a target. Uh, okay, I don't know. I, I remember reading somewhere that some, some, kind of, some kind of a unit where maybe it's one of these ceremonial units, you know, where you've got, you got to be six foot tall to get into it. Actually, Navy SEALs are actually shorter. Oh, yeah? They're shorter and bulkier, yeah. Okay, so whatever. I'm saying, but... So, you know, what's to work it the other way around, right? Somebody wants to be a Navy SEAL and he's six foot two tall, that he's not going to become it. It's not going to happen, right? It just can't be. I think that if somebody, if somebody has intellectual aspirations, it's possible for a person to work on themselves to expand their intellectual capabilities. That's something which I think every, <coughs> everybody can do, although possibly not in our generation. <clears throat> anyway... After we asked for the bracha of, of Bina, we asked for the bracha of Tshuva. What is Tshuva? Repentance. So it's an interesting thing. What are we using our knowledge for over here? Uh, we're using our knowledge to become better people, right? We're using our knowledge to become closer to God. We're using our knowledge to reach the levels that we're supposed to reach. So after we've become more knowledgeable, we then ask God for the blessing of Tshuva. Hashivenu avinu letoratecha, that God, we, we should draw back towards our Father. Right? Because the whole idea over here, if knowledge, it's not knowledge for the sake of knowledge, right? We're not, we're not interested in people becoming, you know, it's, Torah is not an intellectual pursuit. 
which means that the, you just keep you know, accumulating more and more knowledge and becoming wiser and wiser. That's not the way it goes because the knowledge that you accumulate inside of Judaism is supposed to turn you into a better person. Yeah, you know, there's a, there's a, uh, there's a beautiful story. <coughs> Rav Moshe Feinstein, who was the, the accepted halakhic authority from the last generation, he died about 30 years ago. Um, he, uh, he, he was not a very tall man. He was five foot tall, I think. Maybe, maybe not even. And uh, one day, I think I told you this story, but you know what? It's such a beautiful story. I like the story. That one, one day, a father came <coughs> to get a bracha from Rav Moshe because his, fa- his son was not physically growing. I'm always struck by the, by the I don't know, by the, the, you know, the, 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 the complete insensitivity of the father <laughs> coming, coming to Rav Moshe, who's five foot tall, because his son's not growing physically. I don't know, so I'm missing something over here somewhere, I think. But Rav Moshe Feinstein gave this kid a little pinch on his cheek, and he told the father, don't you worry, he says, I know some small people that became big. <laughs> Which means in, in, in Judaism, the idea of becoming big is that the, the greater you become, so the, the, the greater your midot, the greater your characteristics become, the better your personality is, the better your traits are, the kinder you are, the gentler you are, all of that is going to be fit together with the bino. The more, the more knowledge I accumulate, the better I should be at being able to deal with other people. Yeah. And that brings us on to the broth of tshuva, right? Tshuva is there because now I understand the things that I've done wrong. I need to ask HaKadosh Baruch Hu to help me to bring me back in complete repentance to you. And then over here in the next broth of Slach Lonu, so... There's a halachic dimension over here that when you say the words of chatanu, which means we've sinned, and pashanu, which means that we've sinned, what, what, chatanu is that we've sinned maybe unintentionally, uh, pashanu is that we've sinned intentionally, you're supposed to give yourself a little, a little bang on the chest. Right? Um, so <clears throat> what, what have we got? We say after we've done tshuva, then we've got to reach a level of forgiveness, which means tshuva is not, repentance is not, a level in and of its own, but rather it's a it's a, something that's going to bring us onto something which is greater. Like a build up. Yeah. yeah, for sure. Which means that you've got to, you know, the tshuva is going to bring you to the slicha, to the idea of forgiveness, that Akarish Boch is going to forgive us for what we've done. And then, following the chronology, after you have asked for knowledge, and after you have asked for forgive, uh, repentance, and after you have been forgiven, you then get to the brach of Geula, which is redemption, which makes perfect sense. How are we going to bring about the, the Mashiach? How are we going to bring about the Messianic era? No. By doing tshuva, right? It's, it's really not that complicated. That's the other alternative, yes. right? Not really. <laughs> there's a, uh, you know, there's a cute, cutesy story that they tell <laughs> about a fellow who is, has to look after his kid one Sunday afternoon. So he decides that he's going to have a few hours peace and quiet, right? He wants to read the, he wants to read the newspaper. So he takes out the magazine. There's a double spread of the world. So he tears it up into pieces, and he says to his kid, here, put the world back together. Right? Imagining that his kid's going to be nice and quiet, a little puzzle, right? It'll be quiet for hours. Anyway, after half an hour, the kid comes back. He says, Daddy, I said, I'm finished. So the father, of course, like every proud father, says, you know, well, it can't be what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> And then he says, uh, okay, let's go and look. And he sees, he comes and takes a look. He sees that the world, the world is all in place. So he says to the kid, how did you do that? So the kid said, it really wasn't very difficult. He said, on the other side of the paper, there was a picture of a man. He said, I just put the man together and the world fell into place by itself. Mm-hmm. The Hasidic Rebbe oh. say that if you, if you, if you, if you, if you sort yourself out, you'll sort, the, you'll sort the world out. Right? We just we have to learn how to stop, stop looking at everything in its enormity and imagining there's no way that I'm going to be able to do anything. But rather, let me worry about turning myself into who I need to turn into. And by doing that, it's going to turn the world into a better place. The world, the world will fall into place. Which means that the ge'ulah is going to come through the fact that we went through the process of tshuva and we went through the process of ge'ulah and imit Hashem. So here, yeah, Rabbi say, understand, the only thing that's stopping the Mashiach from coming is the fact that you haven't done tshuva yet. You understand that, right? It can't, it can't be me. And I can't be a fool over here, which means it must be you people. 
Which means that if you want the Mashiach to come, Moshe, there's no trying, there's no point trying to deny it over here. If you want the Mashiach to come, you've got to do tshuva. What about the people that do tshuva? You know, why should they be penalized because the rest of the world didn't do tshuva? Because, you know what? It's a good question because at the end of the day, bringing the Mashiach is something which is, it's got to be collective. It's, it's not enough for one person to be able to do it. Yeah, Shabbos, yeah. everybody keeps Shabbos. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's interesting. The Jewish, the Jewish people are, are like one body. Right? Mm-hmm. Rashi says, when it says, Vayichan, Kenegid Ahad, that the Jewish people came and they encamped next to the mountain, it's a very famous Rashi. Rashi says, Ki'ishachad Belevichad. They were like one person with one heart. Right? Which means that the Jewish people, we, we all belong to the same body, which means it's not enough just for me to do tshuva, because my doing tshuva is going to take part. It's going to take care of my part of the body. But in order for everything to fall into place, it requires everybody getting involved in the tshuva process. You hear that? The, I, I think. I think. If I'm, not, if I'm not mistaken, I think it's a Yerushalmi, a Jewish Talmud, which says that when somebody sins, like, sorry, when somebody trips up, they don't. They don't turn. They don't start. You know, giving their leg a, a hard time, right? You know, how did you trip me up? A person, his right leg gets entangled in his left leg and he falls over. You don't see him getting up and giving his left leg a hard time. Like, you know, what do you think you're doing? You idiot. You know, can't you walk straight? What are you, what are you tripping me up for? Because... You blamed on yourself or the other person. What? You blamed on yourself or someone else. I normally blame it on somebody else. Yeah. Or, the, or right? the rock that somehow... For sure, whatever it was. made it there. Get the lawyer. <laughs> Yeah, but you're hipsha, right? That's what, that's what Chazal say. Chazal say, you don't, you don't blame your body for the mistakes that have been made. So instead of us pointing, we're, we're all one body, right? So instead of us pointing towards everybody else and saying it's their fault and it's their fault and it's their fault, we need to recognize that if something hasn't changed, right, if the, if the situation is not any better than it was, then I am as much responsible for this as everybody else is. I guess we got we got to work we got to work hard on that. We've got to work hard on on accepting that responsibility. If we do that, we'll bring the geula. We'll bring about the redemption. And then comes the next bracha. The next bracha is Rafa'enu. Rafa'enu is a, is a, a very interesting bracha, right? Asking for healing. We say Rafa'enu Hashem v'nerofeh that Hakadosh Baruch Hu he should heal us. He should save us. The uh, Rabbi Yonason uh, sorry, Rav Yaakov Emden. No, Rav Yonason, I'm sorry, Rav Yonason Ibishid says the most incredible thing over here. The eighth bracha in the Amida is Rafa'enu. The number eight is a very significant number because the number eight always represents a concept of being la mala minateva, something which is above nature. Right? Number seven is a natural cycle. Number seven is a natural number. So you've got the seven days of the week, seven days of the creation. Number eight represents something which is beyond nature, right? Above nature. 50th day of the Omer, right? 49 days is 7 times 7. And then the 50th day, even though it doesn't divide into 8, is the epitome of that number 8, that concept of being something which is above nature in, in supernatural dimensions. Uh, hold on, ask Rabbi Yonis and Abish, it's a very simple question, it really does. How can you pray for somebody who's terminally ill? You're taking God's name in vain, right? Somebody has, an, somebody has a sickness for which there is no known cure. Well, that's because the doctor said. Oh, so here, he says like this. He says that Lemaise, if you're davening for somebody, you're praying for somebody who's got a terminal illness. Or you know what, let's, let's, let's not be so morbid. Somebody who's got a chronic illness, right? Which means that Baruch Hashem, they're going to live, live a long, they'll be able to live a long life, but they're going to suffer inside of their life. They'll suffer from whatever they've got, right? So maybe, maybe, it'll be, maybe they've got asthma, maybe they have diabetes. Baruch Hashem, all these things today are easily taken care of, right? But it's a chronic, it's a chronic state of being. Ask Rabbi Yonas and how can you how can you daven for somebody who's got a chronic illness? How can you daven for somebody who's got a terminal illness? So he says, because the Jewish people, we exist lemalaminatem, we exist above and beyond nature. We're not we're not tied down to nature, which means it's true that the doctors say that this particular thing over here is not curable, but a Kodesh Baruch can do whatever he wants, right? Yeah, it's kind of like blessing Hashem for resuscitating their dead, you know. How are you going to pray for... I mean, we're not technically praying for... Yeah, so prayer. over there, you're not... You're not right, you're, what you're doing is you're just stating... It's a statement of fact, right? That, that God does that. Yeah. That's different. Over here, especially inside of the prayer, if you look at the prayer that you recite down at the bottom yeah, in the right. gray box, 
right, where you can ask for a very specific, you know, for a person, right? You hear at some of Fanecho, Hashem Elokai, Velokei Avusai, Shetishlach Meheru Furish Limina Shemaim, that Kurish Bokhu should send a cure from the Shemaim, Rufus a Nefesh, Rufus a Guf, it should be for his soul and for his body, and then you can say exactly who you're davening for. By davening, you can ask for anything you want in the wrong way. Yeah. Why by the Rufuino, you have your Firachi? You know what, I, I, I think the chat is like this. I, I think the chat is that because so many people daven for sick people, like normally, you know, it's, 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 it's so uh, the sages came along and they came up with a nusach that was going to be universal, something that would take care of everything. Uh, you know, I'll give you a very basic example. You know, over here it says, Rafusa Nefesh or Rafusa Guf. Well, most people, if they were, you know, somebody's not well, so you daven for them, it wouldn't occur to you to daven for the refus and nefesh. You say refus and goof, right? So the chazal came along and they said, no, 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 you know what? The, the, the source is going to be from the nefesh. So daven for refus and nefesh or refus and goof. I think, I think that's what the chat is over here. Anyway, Rabbi Sai, come on, this is, this, is not a, this is not the moment to try and uh, to sort out. Uh, the various, the various issues. Therapy. No, absolutely not. Yeah. <clears throat> um, so we, so we have the bracha for a four over there in the bracha for healing people. You can ask God to heal whoever you want, right? <coughs> However, you should keep in mind that if you you're praying for that. somebody who's not Jewish, then you should avoid using exactly the text that appears over here because it says that God, right? It says. Amongst the sick people of Israel. So you should just write. But talk that amongst the sick people. Just leave it like that. Yeah, hold on, yeah. How sick does a person have to be? I mean, I don't I don't know. I you know what? It it's I, I think it's it's a question which is very difficult to quantify. It really is. Because you know, somebody somebody could be suffering from a let's say a very painful toothache. Right? Yeah, like, so you, you know that in, a, in three days' time, you know it's going to pass. You know, it's just how root canal work, right? Uh, can you pray for them? You can pray for them right now. They're suffering, All right. right? You know, a person may be suffering from a migraine, right? So you know that in, in, in eight hours' time, it's going gonna, it's gonna to disappear, right? Can you pray for them now? Yeah, I think you can. Should you pray for somebody who's got a cold? Maybe not. Maybe that's not, you know, maybe that's not causing enough... Enough distress or enough, you know. I don't. I don't know. It's, it's it's very hard. Certainly, you don't. You don't know. You don't. You don't have to wait till somebody's terminal to pray for them, right? Somebody's so you know, somebody breaks their leg, right? You you can pray for them for yeah. sure, right? An example would be like a person had their leg bitten by a dog, right? Therefore, the dog. Uh, therefore, the person with the de- with the bitten be bitten doesn't get cured, it's like taking a long time to cure itself. It needs to be cleaned over and over and over. Right. So therefore it wasn't considered to be like it wasn't something that it wasn't it wasn't it wasn't considered to be Yeah, I th- I think I think you could pray time. I think what you could pray for person? something like that for sure. <laughs> I just I don't I don't know I don't know how to define it exactly. I don't I don't know how to say to you, look, you know, if somebody's got this, yeah. then yes, and if <laughs> they've got that, then no. But I think if somebody's been bitten by a dog and it's taking a long time for whatever it is to cure, to, he- to heal, then for sure, for sure you should be able to dab them for them. Why not? What about, what about saying someone's name when they're saying Mishaberach, <coughs> saying a person's name who's not Jewish? So again, over there, it's the same thing because inside of the, inside of the text for the Mishaberach, it's talking about the, the sick people of Israel, which means it's probably better not to do that. Well, what is fascinating, just in general, when it comes to praying for somebody who's sick, you're supposed to use the person's name and the person's mother's name. And we don't normally do that. Normally, the name that's used is the father's name. Right? right? When you get called up to the Torah, whenever, whenever you use somebody's name, you normally use the father's name. And yet over here, when it comes to asking God to cure somebody who's sick, we ask God using the name of the sick person plus the name of his mother. Right? Why is that? Because there's an Indian that the, the, uh, that the mother evokes divine mercy in a way that the father doesn't. Right? So when we come in front of God and we're asking, we're, we're, like, we're, pulling, we're pulling all the protection that we can at the moment. Right? We're pulling all the strings that we can in order to try to make sure that God will listen to the prayer to, to heal this person. 
And then the next bracha coming along is the bracha of prosperity. So, Rabbi I hope you're all paying attention. I am. It says prosperity. <laughs> I like that one. I hope you're all paying attention that the prayer for health comes before the prayer for wealth. If you have wealth, then no cat no health. Which means that we, we all of us understand intellectually that health is more important than wealth. We all understand that, right? But somehow, from the intellectual dimension into the practical dimension, we lose sight of that, and we imagine that if a person's got money, then they're going to be okay, right? So it's true that if you've got money, you can afford to pay for medical health, you know, medical care that you don't, uh, that you wouldn't have. But if somebody's not healthy, then it, it, it doesn't matter, right? It's also going to be that for the second husband. <laughs> the, uh, <clears throat> the, the, you know, they say that money, money can't buy you happiness, but it can certainly, it can certainly make you, it can certainly allow you to live miserably comfortably. So, you know, good. Okay, the, the choice. I, I'm always reminded there was a friend of my in-laws who was, became sick with cancer, and he tried all different kinds of um, treatments, all new kinds of things that were coming on, onto the market, and there was something new which came onto the market which was being done in America and it was going to cost a million dollars. It was brand new and uh, to get there, right, he was already very sick. So a lot, a lot of the cost of that million dollars was just getting him to America and then keeping him in America and going through the treatment for however long it was going to take. And, uh, and uh, you know, he decided at the end, he decided he's not going to do it. Because it was something which no, there were no, there were no uh, statistics. It was all brand new, and that was that was what he had. And if he, if he, you know, if he, uh, if he spent that on himself, there would be nothing left for anybody else, not for his children, not for his wife afterwards. And in the end, he decided that he wasn't going to do it. Right? It's interesting. We see very often this idea of health that people, you know, health is health is Akharish Baruch gives us our health, and health is paramount. It really is. You know, Amir Tashem, we should all be healthy. And we should all be able to serve God without having to deal with complicated medical issues. And that's why the bracha for wealth always comes after the bracha for health, because it's just it's more fundamental. Health is more important than wealth is. You can't use the wealth being healthy. I mean, you can, but you'll use it to try and make yourself healthy. That that's what that's what people will do, right? There's a famous story they tell about a, a, a chosid who came into the Rebbe and he says, Rebbe, he said, I don't have any money. He says, I need to marry off my children. He says, you've got to help me. You've got to pray for me. So the Rebbe says, sure, no problem. Tell me how much you want. So the guy says, Rebbe, I'm not a greedy man. $10 million should take care of it. <laughs> what are you smiling about? It's not, $10 million is not what it used to be, you know that. No, it's Once, $10 million was a lot of money today. It says ten ten million dollars will do it, right? So uh, so the uh, Rebbe says, okay, leave it with me. And the Chos is on his way out, and the Rebbe calls him back, and he says, right, just, it says one minute. He says, just tell me again, if you were drowning in a river right now, how much money would you want me to pray to God for? <laughs> and the Chos, you know, looks at the Rebbe for a little bit, and he says, Rebbe says, that's not a that's not a fair question. <laughs> Very often, God has given us what we want. We just, we, we just don't always recognize it, right? We're so busy looking at what we don't have, we don't look to see what we do have. That's a... It's true. That, that's a, right? I mean, that's a, you know, whatever. It's hum, human nature in a certain way, but it's when something you get, that we When have you to, get hurt or when you get sick, you take being whole for granted. Oh, for sure, right? Even when, like, I don't know, I've sprained my ankle before. Even when I've sprained my ankle, I've just noticed how annoying is it to have a sprained ankle and not be able to walk up and down the stairs. Yeah, and go do both it. arms. Exactly. That's and if you, if, you, walk, if you need any help. <laughs> no, no, I broke, I broke, like, all my wrist bones in both arms. And how, how do you do that? And both my arms, skate, like, bombing a hill on a skateboard. Ooh. And I fell. I don't know what that means either, Rabbi. Yeah, so, so how old like, were you? I, this was when I was 20. What? You were 20 riding a skateboard? Yeah. Gosh. That, yeah, yeah. Wow. So I, I broke every single bone in both wrists, and I didn't get surgery, thank God, but I had it on for two months, and you really... Oh, my gosh. How on earth did you manage? I had it at a girlfriend. <laughs> I guess okay. that's what they're for. Okay, I, I guess. 
No, but I that's, mean, if you I really, that, really, that, really, that, really. That's best friends. Oh, wait, no, best friends are there. It's, a, it's, 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 un, it's unbelievable, huh? It, it, I, I tell you more than that. Here, everybody here in this room, we all know perfectly well that if you broke, if you break, Khalil, if you break both your hands. So we all understand that you're now completely, you know, we're cut, in, incapacitated. Time. Thank you, right? We, we all know that. But you know what? What about somebody who gets an ingrown toenail? You don't function. It's like compared, compared to breaking both arms, an ingrown toenail is nothing, right? It's absolutely nothing on, on the scale of what can go wrong, right? And in the ingrown toenail is nothing. But we, we all know that a tiny little thing that upsets the, it upsets the balance in the body, and all of a sudden the person's not, you're, like not, you're, you're, not, you're, just, you're not focused, you're not, you're, not, you're not being productive, you can't do anything, right? Having a cold sore inside your mouth. Yeah, right? You know, big, big deal, right? You know, big deal. Yeah. yeah. Canker sore, man. Canker sore. The worst. They yeah, say that a, anybody has kidney stones, which some of you may have. Any, no, the pain is just as worse as a woman giving birth. Yeah. I know somebody, she had an emergency appendicitis in the middle of the year. And at the end of the year, she spoke, she spoke one, one of the schools that I teach, she spoke in the, to the whole school, and she told them, she said, never ever, you know, there's a brocha you make when you come out of the bathroom, right? Yeah, she said, don't, sure. don't take that brocha for granted. Don't, don't wait for something to go wrong until you recognize exactly how great this blessing is that God gave you. So our bodies work. Baruch Hashem, the body works, right? Ten fingers, ten toes. You know, it, it's doing what it's supposed to do. We should, don't take it for granted. Don't imagine you get up in the morning that that's the way that it's supposed to be. But rather, give thanks to God. Right? So I imagine the truth of that, I mean, you're, you're probably a little, a little bit more, yeah, but you're probably a little bit more, you know, I don't know if the word appreciative is the right word, but at least more aware of, of you know, manual dexterity than other people because of what you went through, right? We, we should try to reach that level of, without having to go through it, right? We shouldn't have to go through such terrible pain and such terrible, you know, anguish in order to be able to recognize that Akharish Baruch Hu gave us bodies that work, Baruch Hashem, that they work. <laughs> okay, I guess we're going to stop over here. I'll tell you, the, reason, the real reason why we're stopping over here is because you've got to be the only person in the world that I have ever met who broke both arms and seems to, seems to be nostalgic for those days.